Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to what is now the 38th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time and for all of our regulars. Uh, welcome back to this edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. I'm just quickly going to run through couple of introductory slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Um, in terms of if you're joining us for the first time in terms of companies that uh, we normally have presenting at these events, it's uh, companies with a market cap under 300 million in market capitalization that are in revenue and approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable. We generally take companies from outside the resources and biotechnology sectors, as those sectors are kind of well serviced by other events. So in essence, we, we try to give a platform to what we term as industrial microcaps, which is a kind of a broad term encompassing uh, all of the other sectors, whether that's small cap financials, media companies, hardcore industrial products businesses, as uh, microcap technology companies. Uh, structure the webinar for anybody who has joined us for the first time this morning. Uh, as I say, we normally run these every fortnight. More recently, we've been doing them every week. It runs over an hour. Each company gets 30 minutes in which it's broken down into a 20 minute presentation. And then we leave it 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Uh, in the navigation bar, please don't use the, the chat function, it just makes it easier to moderate the questions to our presenters at the end. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, you can get us on Twitter at C Microcaps, as I said, YouTube for recording of this webinar and you will find all the previous events up on there linkedin where i do some additional long form content i also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter where i profile one interesting asx microcap every week you can find that on the substack newsletter platform uh, so first up we have Martin Pomeroy, CEO of smartpay holdings who's joining us from auckland and in a I guess international themed event. We'll be then going to Chicago, where Michael Carpacci, CEO of Beam Communication Holdings, will be joining us after Martin's presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Martin. If you want to start sharing yours. Certainly will. Thank you, Mark. Um, if you just go to, yeah, that, 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 looks, that looks perfect now, Martin, you're good to go. Well, thank you, Mark, for the opportunity to present this morning. Good morning, everybody. As uh, introduced, I'm Marty Pomoy, CEO and Managing Director of SmartPay. Uh, great to speak to you all this morning um, from, uh, from Auckland. Uh, a bit straight into it. I've, I've put together a, a relatively brief presentation this morning. I appreciate many of you will, will likely have an awareness of who we are already, but I'll begin with an overview of our business. Uh, I will then take you through an insight into our opportunity and market, objectives and key growth areas, and our points of difference. We operate on a March uh, financial year, so I've also included a quick review of our recently reported FY21 full year results with some commentary. And finally, I'll provide a summary and outlook for the remainder of FY22 and beyond. Um, post the presentation, I would obviously welcome any questions you may have. So who is SmartPay? We're a merchant facing in-store or card present, as it's described, Trans-Tasman FPOS payments provider. We provide FPOS acceptance devices to all types of businesses, predominantly in the small to medium enterprise segment, across both New Zealand and Australia. Our current terminal network across both countries is over 37,000 devices installed, and we have over 15 years experience operating in this space. In New Zealand, we have a mature business holding a significant position in market. 
where we provide over 30,000 terminals on fixed term service contracts, contracts. And this is reflected in a predominantly fixed monthly revenue model for our New Zealand business. Our New Zealand business provides the head office functions and operational leverage, including our finance and engineering technical capability and capacity, supporting our Australian growth. In Australia, we have a smaller but fast growing market position. The key difference between the offerings in the two countries is in Australia, we provide the full in-store payment experience to the merchant, including the daily settlement of their daily card payments. In payments terminology, this is called acquiring. In essence, we charge a nominal fee as a percentage of the value of our customer sale transaction, and this is reflected in the transactional revenue model for our business. It is in the Australian market that we're having most of our significant growth, so I will spend the next few slides focusing on this opportunity. A quick look at the Australian acquiring market and the growth opportunity we're executing into. The total in-store terminal market in Australia is approximately 1 million devices. We are targeting the small to medium enterprise segment of this market and through research have determined this to be circa 250,000 businesses with the remainder falling into the categories of medium or institutional sized businesses. In the last five to seven years, changes in the acquiring regulations in the Australian market have allowed for new entrants into the market which up until then had been the sole domain of the major banks with some involvement at a smaller scale from second tier banks. As such, the majority of the addressable market we are targeting in Australia is supported by legacy providers, the main banks, with what are best described as hygiene factor propositions. The existing or incumbent providers are largely structured to support the medium to institutional end of town and struggle to provide direct customer engagement for in-store payment solutions to our target market. Pricing structures for solutions provided by the existing providers are also often complex and difficult for small to medium business owners to initially understand and then to financially unbundle on a monthly basis when they are charged fees. With the ongoing evolution of digital payment types, including wallets, phone and wearable based payments, QR code acceptance and cloud-based SaaS model POS providers, the banks are not well paced, placed to compete in the ongoing payments technology arms race. So I'll describe a little bit our difference and we are a customer centric organization. So I think the best way to present this is by putting a customer lens on and giving you the insights that we get from our customers. Our view as an organization is that, uh, and, and we've experienced this and realized this through our New Zealand business, is a stable and loyal base of customers with long-term brand and business value is realized through providing meaningful, valuable solutions to our customers that solve real problems. We've distilled our experience over 15 years servicing this market um, um, to an understanding of some core complexity and challenges that our customers face. Firstly, and possibly more importantly than ever, given the disruption and challenges brought about by the COVID pandemic and regional and national lockdowns, cash flow was king. Our customers are often owner operators and very few are payments experts. Further, the vast majority of our customers don't have full-time accountants, procurement personnel, or financial controllers in their business. Therefore, removing financial complexity and confusing monthly card processing statements and reducing both the time cost and financial cost to their business is of high value to them. Our customers need partners in order to be successful, and we take an attitude of having one job. To ensure that we maintain a solution that allows our customers to take payments from their customers anytime, all the time. Do not let us down. As mentioned a minute ago, SME owners can be time poor. And so when they have a problem with their in-store payment solution, they want it solved at a time that suits them. Payments is an evolving environment and can be complicated to understand. And our customers need support and expertise from their partners to help them understand the future and keep them informed of changes that may impact them. 
fundamentally, the overwhelming feedback from customers is that they have their hands full running their business, often fulfilling a number of roles in that business, and are looking for partners and providers who add value and let them get on with their business. So I'll talk now a little bit about the propositions that we have in market. As I mentioned, we have extensive payments IP and expertise, and we continue to leverage this competency to grow out into our Australian opportunity. One of our key differentiators from the large incumbent providers is we understand our target audience, the SME market, and have years of insight into the key drivers our customers focus on when choosing providers. Our IP and insight into our customers led us to introduce two terminal and acquiring solutions into the Australian market in early 2018. Our key proposition, which we promote as zero cost FPOS and represents the majority of new business and new customers we acquire, is a merchant surcharge product we brand as Smart Charge. Smart, is a, Smart Charge is a unique offering in the Australian market and engineered quite differently to the other surcharge offerings in market. At a basic level, Smart Charge allows our customer to pass on to the cardholder an agreed cost of acceptance. I won't go into too much detail on the competitive advantage of our solution, but a couple of key differences worth mentioning are as follows. Firstly, we set the fee that is charged to the cardholder by our customer. This is critical as it ensures both our customer and smart pay are aligned to the compliance and rules governing surcharging of card payments. We provide the customer the ability to charge the cardholder for every transaction, regardless of card type or whether the transaction is a tap or contactless, as it's described, transaction. We settle the funds to our customers next day for their prior day's trading, excluding the fee that was charged to the cardholder. From a cash flow perspective, this means whatever we settle into the customer's account is theirs, and they will not receive a bill from us at the end of the month for payment of card acceptance fees. As I mentioned pr uh, previously, we are finding this solution particularly resonates with our customers and our target market in the post-COVID environment, where cash flow is king and cost management for small businesses is critical. Our view is that the small to medium enterprise market is particularly attractive from an acquiring perspective due to the predominant use of domestic cards versus international cards. And I'll, I'll attempt to describe why that's an important insight. Different cards and market are subject to different variable costs to acquire with overseas cards, international cards, if you like, uh, subject to a higher interchange fee than a domestically issued card. So a user of a domestically issued Visa or MasterCard is subject to a lower interchange fee and a lower cost to accept than an international card holder would be. This fee is called interchange. Interchange is the largest portion of the variable cost smart payers charge to acquire cardholder transactions and is pays, paid as a percentage of each transaction to the card issuers, most often the cardholders bank. Our main competitors mostly provide solutions where the merchant is charged different rates to accept different cards. These solutions are generally defined as, an, as interchange plus or called an interchange plus and are simply calculated as the addition of a set margin on the different interchange rate applicable to different cards. As you can imagine, these solutions are complex to understand for the business owner and add complexity to understanding what their total cost of acceptance will be at the end of the month when the statement comes through from their current provider. Our other product and market is our simple flat rate solution. This sets a single acceptance rate for all Visa and MasterCard cards accepted and provides the merchant with a greater level of certainty of acceptance cost each month and is certainly taken up where the customer may prefer to have a solution that doesn't pass that card acceptance onto their card holder. This often suits customers who have a higher, uh, what we call average ticket size, where they're mindful um, and wary of passing on the fee to the card holder for that transaction. I'll now talk about how we uh, address our customers and the difference. So how are we doing at solving these problems for our customers, the ones I described here? Our net promoter score and, and net promoter scoring, um, just if I give a bit of a background on what that is, 
It measured the percentage of promoters versus detractors um, on a simple criteria of how willing an existing customer is to refer others to SmartPay. So it measures how many customers are thinking positively of you versus negatively of you in terms of would they recommend your business to other customers. It's the main tool we use for both regular structured customer feedback and as our business KPI, reporting how we're performing against our customer experience objectives. This measure is globally recognized as a key indicator of successful customer experience execution and is adopted by most major brands in a broad range of industries. Our average Australian NPS of 59 is well ahead of the published results of our peers. We conduct NPS surveys twice annually and a significant part of the value we derive from the customer feedback we receive is the input into our technology and engineering roadmaps and plans to continually improve our customer solutions. Customer feedback has resulted in the development of a number of innovations over the years, including our cloud-based POS integration platform called Smart Connect, the launch over two years ago of our QR-based payment application in both New Zealand and Australia, initially to support Alipay and WeChat pay acceptance in our tourism customers, and most recently, the development of our transaction reporting hub, whereby merchants can review online their own transactions, receive statements, and engage directly with our business. Our main marketing channels to date have been social and digital, and we store, score strongly in key influence measures such as Google reviews compared to our peers. Our 24 by seven contact center team ensures we have an expert available anytime, day or night, to support customers with their in-store smart pay solutions. Customers have one number to call from anywhere in New Zealand and Australia, anytime. Fundamentally, we pride ourselves on being easy to do business with, as we believe this sets us apart from our competition. And we regularly receive positive feedback from customers, not only commenting on our product, but on their experience with our business. Ultimately, our customers are our advocates. The best new customer opportunity we ever get is one that was referred by one of our existing customers. As part of our ongoing growth plans into the Australian market, we're targeting some specific verticals within the SME segment and have developed customer case studies to support our marketing and sales efforts. The case studies we've developed reinforce we are delivering customer value, successfully solving customer problems and are a legitimate disruptor to the incumbent provider's market position. I've just included a little excerpt from one of our uh, uh, customer case studies in this slide to give you a sense of the sort of cost savings that we can provide to small businesses on an annual basis. Um, and also to give you a bit of an insight into how our customers are, if you like, I suppose, reapplying the savings that they're making into uh, things that add value for their own business. Um, so I, I think that's quite an insightful little slide. I'll now talk about some of the key metrics and, and sort of performance um, uh, of our business. Our Australian business is fundamentally a sales and marketing operation. As I mentioned earlier, we leverage uh, technical uh, and engineering capacity out of our New Zealand operation. Our finance function um, resides in New Zealand, et cetera. So it's afforded us the luxury of being able to leverage that and really be focused on the sales and marketing um, effort into Australia. Uh, we calculate our customer acquisition, uh, including marketing costs, sales costs, hardware and distribution costs. And we work out a cash return period based on gross margin um, of about five to seven months. In essence, our cash payback period is about five to seven months um, when compared to those, uh, to those uh, acquisition costs that I just mentioned. The average ticket size uh, of our merchant portfolio is between $30 to $50, which, which I, I think is a, is a further insight into our attraction to this part of the acquiring market, small to medium enterprise market, um, and, and certainly certain ver verticals within that market, as it presents a surcharge amount in the cents per transaction, and therefore receives very little res resistance from cardholders. So the point there being the rate that we put on top of the, the, the sale value that gets passed on to the cardholder at a $30 to $40 average ticket size, that additional charge is in the sense. Um, so there, there is very little uh, sort of, I suppose, pushback from cardholders um, and it covers off that concern from our customers 
Um, that, that's the thing that most of our customers are wary of, is any hesitation from the card holder um, based on, on having the fee passed on. Our fleet is a mixture of historically acquired flat rate merchants. So when we first launched our products in Australia, uh, we had an actual existing partnership with a second tier bank. And uh, the first product we put in market was that simple flat rate product. And that was basically so that we could get um, those customers who were, who were with that second tier bank over onto our own portfolio. Um, so that gave us a, 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 an initial fleet of acquiring customers in Australia. Um, the reality is the bulk of the customers uh, that we take on now are on our um, smart charge uh, product, which is that uh, product that passes the fee onto the cardholder. Uh, the blend in our fleet at the moment is circa 30% of our fleet are on the simple flat rate product and approximately 70% of our fleet are on our higher margin smart charge product. Uh, that's given us an improving margin over time. So as we grow, our margin has grown because the smart charge product is a, is a higher margin product for us. Uh, further supporting um, our margin growth is um, the, 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 the long-term move um, away from cash as a preferred payment method in store to card. Um, so that, that's been going on for many years now. It was, uh, there was a bit of a step change in it through the COVID period last year where businesses simply weren't accepting cash as a form of payment, um, but there's still uh, time to go. Cash is still being used out there, but the growth of cards is an ongoing, an ongoing trend. Our entry to the acquiring market in Australia purposely leveraged the existing transactional processing infrastructure through a partnership with Cascal. So in order to be able to acquire, you have to uh, either process the transactions yourself or partner with a processor um, to handle those transactions for you. Uh, that, that describes the process of um, sending the different cards that are accepted to whoever the, uh, the scheme is. So Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or the domestic debit scheme, that's called switching. Um, our, our entry in the market, as I said, with our preferred approach was to partner with an existing provider. It greatly reduced, obviously, our entry costs and timeframes but also ensured that as we grow and therefore our transactional volumes grow, we benefit from improved economies of scale um, through volume-based transactional processing cost reductions. It also keeps us out of the compliance regime associated to switching. Um, there is a compliance regime um, set out globally for the terminal um, hardware and the software that resides on the terminal. We have the uh, IP and expertise internally to deal with that across both Australia and New Zealand, and that's what we do. That, that sets up, I guess, to some degree, a bit of a moat around our business, our expertise and competency there. But there is also a compliance regime associated to the processing switch, um, which is the obligation of our partner, not us. Ultimately, leveraging our existing mature New Zealand operating structure, and focusing on the underserved SME acquiring market in Australia has allowed us to rapidly grow our Australian revenues. Okay, um, I'll now provide some commentary on our most recent results release, uh, which is for our 21 financial year ending March 21. We're very pleased with the overall performance of the business for our 21 financial year in uh, what can only be described as a very challenging period for our customers and our team. Overall revenues were 33.8 million, up 19.7% on the prior year of 28.3, with our Australian revenues showing strong growth throughout the reporting period. Australian acquiring transactional revenue grew to 17.1 million, an 80% increase on the prior year. The growth in Australian acquiring revenue came as a result of our continuing effort and investment into marketing and sales activities targeted towards our addressable market opportunity in Australia. Monthly customer acquisition continued to increase throughout the year, resulting in a record month in March 21, and reinforces our view that we are well placed to execute into the sizable opportunity presented in Australia. EBITDA grew to 7.6 million in the period, up slightly compared to the prior period, 7.4, which given the challenging trading conditions experienced by many of our customers through the COVID-19 impacted Q1, is a positive result. The lower percentage increase in EBITDA when, when compared to the percentage increase in revenue for the period, 
reflects the investment increasing our uh, lead generation and sales and marketing capacity as um, the trading restrictions ease. So in June, July last year, as we came out of um, lockdowns um, and the market sort of returned to whatever the new normal was going to be, we took the decision to be very proactive. I, I wouldn't use the word aggressive, but certainly proactive in terms of our investment um, as we believed that the solutions we were taking to market were uh, would re add value, add significant value to customers that received them. Um, so we took a, a, a pretty uh, a pretty positive um, approach to that as those trading restrictions eased. Our marketing expenses compared to the prior year were 1.8 million, an increase of 80%. Um, and that was a mixture of increased spend in uh, the digital and social channels um, to generate leads, and also through increasing our head count from our sales and marketing head count from 10 to 17 through the period to support the increase in lead volume and customer acquisition. Uh, we continue to target the existing in-store SME payment network in Australia with favourable unit economics uh, reflected in a run rate EBITDA at March 21 of 9.8 million. After tax loss of 15.2 million, uh, look, that's mostly due to, well, $12.7 million of it is due to a non-cash related change in the valuation of a convertible note, um, which is just a direct reflection of the steep increase in share price over the period. Um, the bulk of the convertible note was actually converted late December 20, um, so late December, uh, with 1.5 million in principal remaining, uh, with a maturity date of October 21. We also brought forward the amortization of a number of software assets um, as we released new versions of our payment application software in both Australia and New Zealand. Um, this contributed approximately half a million to the increase in depreciation and amortization. We include this graph uh, with each quarterly trading update uh, and we'll continue to provide this moving forward, of course. Uh, the next one will actually be for the June quarter, uh, 22, which will be provided around the middle of July, um, so the middle of next month. Look, it, it, it presents in simple form the growth in our transacting terminal base and the growth in corresponding monthly revenue yield from those terminals. Um, so we've broken it down into financial years. You can see that last year, um, you know, we, we can obviously see around that sort of March, April, May period, the effect of the lockdowns um, on our transacting terminal base in Australia. Um, so it highlights um, the disruption to our customers' revenues and transaction volumes through that period. Um, then obviously as the lockdown ceased, many of those customers started transacting again and we got into market with some uh, sales and marketing initiatives and some acquisition targets um, and, and, and grew well. Uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, the, the uptick in December is a seasonal uplift um, that, that we experience. Uh, we have a number of customers in the hospitality um, uh, segment and the hospitality vertical, and obviously uh, Christmas time in December is a busy trading period for them. Um, so we do expect to see an uptick in, in volumes through that period. Those tend to then come down slightly in January and February, and then normalize out again from March onwards. Uh, so that's 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 the the movements in that uh, revenue line as you see them. Uh, our focus as a business is, is scaling our revenue growth, um, and and I, I I talk about our approach to sales and marketing as being measured. Um, we are not a, a sort of throw uh, things at the wall and see what sticks. We're quite measured and um, uh, I suppose direct in our approach to our growth efforts. Um, so we're really mindful of our unit economics as we continue to grow and look to accelerate our growth. So I guess in summary, uh, financial year 21 demonstrated the uh, resilience of our New Zealand business uh, and further validated our successful go-to-market strategy in the Australian market. Whilst it's fair to say we're still in the early stages of our growth phase compared to our addressable market opportunity, um, the business is scaling very quickly and we now have well-established marketing and sales capability in-house. FY22 will see us continue to develop our payments offering in both countries, broaden awareness of our brand and competitive product offering in Australia, and further scaling our Australian revenue, which is expected to deliver operational leverage and EBITDA growth. I'd now welcome any questions, thank you.
Yeah, thanks, Mark. And we're just up on the full half hour. So I'm going to... Oh, apologies. Uh, we will i'm going to give you one or two questions because i know my um our next presenter is waiting in the wings but maybe if we can just get two or three in here quickly um as you grow do you gain any scale benefits on the switching interchange and scheme fees or are those costs completely variable in nature so, so fees go down as volumes go up would be the best way to describe that from a switching perspective Okay, great. Um, yeah, this is kind of related. Uh, yeah, I don't think you mentioned your presentation. Um, sale of the New Zealand business, is that still on the table or is it on the back burner? Or where, where is that? From, from, from our perspective, it was on the back burner from, from sort of last year, I guess I would say. I can't speak for Verifone, but from our perspective, as you can imagine, um, certainly um, um, couldn't sort of keep a business of 75, 80 people sitting around wondering what was going to come. So uh, from our perspective, off the back of that and the return from uh, lockdown last year, we uh, we, we sort of uh, repurposed the organisation and are um, committed to sort of going forward with the New Zealand business. Okay, great. And a competitive response from the banks to disruptors like yourself, or is it too small a commercial issue for them? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question, and it's one I get often. I think I think the reality of the banks, as I talked about before, is they're sort of more structured towards the top end of town. I mean, one way I'd describe it is this: is if I took one customer off them that had two thousand terminals, there's probably a person employed in the bank to manage that relationship and to look after that client. If I take two thousand single terminals off the bank, I'm not sure that there's. Well, I know there isn't one person in the bank that is responsible for that portfolio of individual customers. So I think, that f firstly, I don't know that they're necessarily structured to compete with us on a customer by customer basis as we are structured in terms of that direct engagement and that sort of uh, customer experience in terms of engagement and then onboarding and ongoing support. Um, the, the second thing is. Um, I don't think the banks are well positioned to compete with us with regards to our technology and our solution. So if I look at the way that our smart charge product markets and work, it's quite differentiated from the bank's um, solution. And if they were to look to evolve their solution to meet the market with regards to ours, I don't know that they have access to the, certainly quickly on an agile basis, to the engineering or technical capability to make those changes. Um, so I, I think that uh, I think that you know it's 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 you know it's fair to question whether they might respond. It's another thing to question whether they would be able to and how they would. I guess. Okay, and maybe just this one. It, it might actually be in the annual report. I know it came out uh, yesterday. Um, EBITDA between the New Zealand and the and the Australian business it, would that be in the notes where you split by geographic region or division of we, the we don't, no, we don't we don't we don't we don't split um, the business below revenue so revenue okay. revenue gets split uh, but we don't split uh, the uh, the the in anything below revenue I guess for the business again I think it's it, it, that reflects how we think about the business is that it's you know, there's quite a, an amount of operational leverage we get out of the New Zealand business to support the Australian business. So we don't split. Okay. Listen, Martin, I think we're going to have to leave it there because we've gone a few mm. minutes over time and I'll uh, ask for uh, forgiveness from Michael when we, when we get to him. Uh, thank no, you. I do very... apologise. No, I do apologise, Mark. I didn't intend to go over time. No problem. Okay, we'll leave it there. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, and I know Michael is patiently waiting for us in Chicago, if uh, he can then start sharing his. Uh, I can see it's, it just I should be out of here now. Yep, uh, there you go, Michael. Uh, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now on full screen. You're, you're good to go, mate. All good. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to learn a bit more about Beam Communications if you're not aware of who Beam Communications is. I'll try to make up for some of the lost time and um, hopefully keep a little bit more time towards the end of the presentation for any questions that anyone may have. The major focus of the presentation is gonna be talking about the Zolio business. 
um, Zolio product and the, the, I guess the major opportunities that Zolio presents to Beam, but also just spending a little bit of time focusing on the underlying business and the opportunities that we have with a lot of our legacy business as we look at the future of the success in the satellite space, particularly off the back of Iridium's major investments. Um, you know, Iridium's just spent over $5 billion replacing their satellite constellation. And that provides a extremely good opportunity for us. And, you know, Beam has been involved in the satellite communication space for nearly 20 years. Uh, we are recognized as a world leader in developing multiband solutions across satellite, Wi-Fi, and mobile um, applications. And we've got a you know, wide range of products, and I'll give you a little snapshot, catering from portable devices and enhanced satellite devices these days that really provide a lot more connectivity for smartphones that cover the rest of the world where you know, typically 80% of the Earth's surface today has no cellular coverage. So, you know, we, we target large and growing niche markets for travelers, adventure seekers, rural residents, and remote and loan workers, which covers the whole gambit of consumer, enterprise, and government applications. You know, we've got a very good track record uh, developing a lot of world's first products, and that's across Iridium, Thuraya, and Inmarsat, three of the four largest mobile satellite service operators in the world. With the launch of our Zolio product, which I'll explain a little bit more um, shortly, the Zolio product is really providing a vehicle for us to bring growing subscription recurring revenues into the business, which is obviously very important for us. For years, we've been manufacturing products, selling products and not enjoying the benefits of the subscription service that comes with those products. But Zolio enables us to get subscription services from the products that we sell to our um, to our customers and obviously just extremely long-standing relationships we've got very good relationships also with kddi out of japan and and telstra out of australia nearly dating back to almost 20 years quick snapshot on the numbers there uh, you know the, the current market cap as of the 21st of may when this investor update was provided to the market was about 16 million dollars cash in the bank over 4.6 million dollars uh, enterprise value 11 and a half million and the share price 52 week range between 15 and 39 and a half cents. Uh, the top 20 shareholders own 60% of the company and the number of shares on issue is just over 75 million. I will now play you a little introduction video just to give you a snapshot of all the products within the beam range. I hope that came through okay on the um, on the video for everyone. But it just gives you a bit of a snapshot of the product range, the, the applications of the products. And I guess most importantly that, you know, for an Australian company, we are operating on a global scale. We're dealing with some very large uh, satellite network operators throughout the world. And most importantly, a lot of these products, as I mentioned, are world's first. So they are products that have been uh, innovated by the Beam team. They are products that have been sold to the satellite network operator and all of the intellectual property in all of the Beam products that you see is actually still owned by Beam. So we're not a contract manufacturer. We're not a design house. Everything we do, we, we design and build for a purpose and enter into contracts with either the satellite network operator or we have Beam branded product or most recently something like the Zolio that we bring to market under a joint venture arrangement ourselves. 
And that just gives you a bit of a scope on the size and the number of, um, of terminals. And also, I guess the important part, unlike any other electronic product that exists in the world, satellite products last a long time. So a lot of our products have been in the marketplace for over 10 years. And you know, some of these products, even 18 years on, are still being manufactured and sold to customers. So quite, quite unheard of for electronic products. I guess on the basis of all of our legacy products, what we really have at the moment is a solid platform for building recurring revenues. So the, business, the legacy business that we have is profitable and continues to be profitable six straight quarters. The underlying business is strong and supported by recurring contracts and their repeat orders for product and also recurring revenues for subscription services. The Beam Sat Phone Shop business, which is an online e-commerce portal that provides satellite phones and accessories, predominantly focusing on Beam's designed and manufactured products, as well as the Zolio product, is Telstra's largest satellite dealer in Australia and provides an extremely good mechanism for us to be able to sell products in Australia to enterprise, government and consumer customers. There is a significant upside from the growth in recurring revenues and subscriptions. And I guess to give you a look at the half yearly results, which don't include all the upside from the recurring revenues, because all the recurring revenues at the moment are still kept within the joint venture structure. So the revenues for the half were $9 million up 26%, and you know, accelerated sales of Zolio and other beam devices more than offset any impact from COVID during the first half. The operating profit up 22% to $481,000 and the cash in the bank through a capital raising late last year, obviously saw the cash in the bank up quite a significant amount to 100, up 175% to 4.4 million. Transitioning to the higher uh, recurring revenues, and that's really stemmed from a hardware model where the hardware was the means to an end for us. The Zolio device providing monthly subscriptions to users, and then value added services that we can add on to those users that then increase the RPUs from each of those devices. And through our relationship with Iridium, we have announced that we're developing new products for the Iridium um, service network. And some of these value added services where we're billing customers for services directly, we'll be able to look at how we can offer those to the market of new products that get developed by, um, by Beam. The Zolio device is obviously what's getting a lot of focus. That's the main driver of, of the potential growth in our recurring revenues. And obviously Zolio has had a lot of success to date, launching a product back in uh, February of 20, in probably some of the hardest conditions, we're still extremely pleased of where Zolio is today. So I'll just play now a video on Zolio to give you a very quick understanding of the Zolio device and its applications. Meet Zolio, enabling seamless global messaging for smartphones. Zolio is an innovative messaging system that connects with your phone to provide messaging that follows you in and out of mobile coverage. You can send a message to your contact's SMS number or email address. And if you share your Zolio number or email with them, they can initiate a message to you. Zolio utilises the Iridium satellite network, keeping users connected from the North Pole to the South Pole. You can also send an SOS alert, check-in message or automatically share your location with your contacts directly from the Zolio device or via the Zolio app on your phone. Zolio provides a unique messaging experience that automatically transitions between satellite, cellular and Wi-Fi connectivity, always choosing the lowest cost network. Zolio, count on your connection. Okay, hopefully that one came through as well. So Zolio is a world's leading global satellite communicator. Zolio as a business and a product is a joint venture between Beam Communications and Road Post Inc. of Canada. Uh, the, as I said, the product was launched early in 2020. The product today is distributed in USA, Canada, and Australia. It, is, it, it was launched as the world's first truly seamless global messaging service, which basically, as you saw there, gives people the ability to use their smartphone to communicate over cellular, Wi-Fi, or satellite anywhere on Earth. Also providing a dedicated phone number, dedicated email address that makes it extremely easy for people to be able to contact or be contacted from anywhere on earth. The major feature set is obviously providing messaging communications, both two-way 
SOS alerting from the device or from the smartphone app, downloading weather and location tracking information, being able to share your location from anywhere on earth. The awards that we've won today, I guess, very much speak for the quality of the product and the market that we've targeted. And then, you know, as you can see there, there's both local and international awards. And probably one of the most prestigious ones that we achieved was the Outdoor Retail Innovation Award, uh, which is a, um, you know, a globally recognized award in the outdoor space. I won't go into details of the plans, but you can see the subscription service that we're all about. So it's about getting the device into the hands of the user. Uh, it retails in Australia for $345, $199 US dollars in North America. And the plans range from $32 a month to $80 a month for unlimited. And you can see at the bottom there we, where we have add-on value-added services, which we'll continue to grow on as we provide other services for our customers. Zolio's advantage, uh, you know, this is factual. The price point is obviously extremely attractive in the Australian marketplace. It's very attractive in the US as well. At 199, it competes uh, extremely well. The, the way the product has been built through the experience that Beam has in designing, you know, extremely good global satellite products. Um, you know, the, the way the messaging and the application works, the quality of the product from a waterproof and dust resistant, you know, no other product in the marketplace has an IP68 mil spec rating and the way we actually manage messages. So it's not so much about the hardware device, it's also the back end and how the back end interface provides the ability for people to have apps to app messaging, supporting 900 characters in one single message. So it's really a much wider community that is um, available for people to communicate with or to, and gives them the ability to you know, get those messages delivered uh, basically anywhere on earth. So often we get asked, you know, how big is this addressable market? You know, do people really need satellite communication devices? This market is very large. It continues to grow. And, you know, you can't underestimate people's desire these days to want to be able to keep in touch no matter where they end up. So, you know, a really good example is across, you know, boating, the caravan industry, hiking, and fringe and rural dwellers. Um, yeah, those numbers are, are obviously quite significant. You know, 2 million boat licenses in Australia, 10,000 new boats every year, 300,000 caravans. You know, the amount of outdoor activity that is taking place while people aren't traveling overseas, COVID has been a major driver for a lot of these market segments. So this is where we particularly focus in the consumer end. You've also got a, a lot of people in Australia that live in areas which are not serviced by 100% coverage, or they can very easily get out of coverage uh, once leaving their hometown. I think Australia at the moment, uh, you know, you're looking at about 24% of the landmass actually has, um, ha has cellular coverage. So there's plenty of spaces in Australia that, um, you know, a Zolio or any satellite device will provide some good connectivity. From a market perspective, the personal communications market continues to grow. Uh, Matt Desch, the CEO of Iridium, in all of his quarterly talks, talks specifically about the opportunities for Iridium and the continued growth. So, you know, Iridium is forecasting off the back of some already significant growth, further growth through to FY25, um, you know, where they're seeing a 29% growth rate. And this does become a very important part of our business and our future, but it's also a very important and strategic part of Iridium's business. So there's a lot of focus on, on this particular space and obviously the importance of the Iridium Global Satellite Network as the delivery mechanism for our business. So we continue to get more orders. This was updated as of the 31st of May. Uh, we recently announced that we're now hitting about 70,000 orders for the Zolio device. Now they're orders for the device from the joint venture entity to Beam. So Beam manufactures those devices and sells those devices to the joint venture entity. As we continue to add retail channels and the growth and uptake of the product throughout the world, obviously the demand and the requirements for more units continues to increase. So you can see there as we've continued to add retailers into our distribution channel, both in North America and Australia, the need for more devices for obviously activated customers, channel fill, 
and coming into the peak seasons of the North American summer and obviously looking towards the end of the year now for um, summer and Christmas Australia. Most recently, we, um, we've announced the appointment of Australia Post, which was a very important and strategic partner for us to provide access to the Zolio product in regional Australia. Also to be able to provide online sales and free delivery of Zolio for people in regional areas. So that was a, a new addition. Anaconda in Australia has proven to be very successful for us. And also that's very much on the back of all the success we've seen in North America through the world's largest outdoor retailers being Cabela's, Bass Pro, REI and MEC. So a very, um, you know, I guess impressive and strategic lineup of how we address the market. The online presence uh, through Amazon and eBay, and then in Australia, Kogan and Catch, you know, they're important e-commerce businesses for us to be able to sell the Zolio product through. All of the sales of those products through the e-commerce marketplaces are all done directly. So, you know, we don't allow dealers to be able to sell products on those e-commerce platforms. Any distribution partners that we have must sell through their own websites which is like Australia Post and Anaconda directly. So we have the benefits of controlling the distribution across third-party marketplaces. The momentum is picking up in Australia. COVID was tough for us. And I know, you know most of you are in lockdowns there as we speak today. But you know, the, I guess the, the ability for people to travel, people are looking at how they can travel throughout Australia. We, we did see quite a significant uptake as soon as the borders uh, were relaxed. And what we're seeing at the moment is the, you know, the revenues per subscriber in Australia are sitting at just over $45 per month. And the churn rate, I mean, quite often you see, you know, new products come to market, which you see there in October. Um, you know, the churn rates can be high when customers' expectations of a product, um, you know, doesn't meet what their needs were. And then obviously people cancel their services. So, you know, through the marketing that we're doing, a lot of the social media, the quality of the distribution channels we were expanding to, now has us in a position sitting well under, um, you know, industry standards of less than 2% churn rate. So the customers we're getting like the product, they, they enjoy the user experience and they're keeping that product active. It is also important to know that the Zolio product only works with Zolio and it only works on the Iridium network. So when someone buys a Zolio product, that Zolio product will always generate revenue for Zolio. It can't go and be used on a competitor's uh, network or with a competitor's service. So it's a very sticky customer that we're, um, we're selling this product to. Just to give you a quick snapshot, you can see there that the, um, you know, the number of retailers that we bring on and obviously the availability of outlets grows. That first image there doesn't include uh, what we've just taken on with Australia Post. So when we report this again next quarter, there'll be significant growth there through the addition of Australia Post. And we also do continue to appoint strategic retailers, uh, both in the um, marine space, camping, fishing, hiking and also looking into the aero uh, markets as well. So we continue to expand our, our distribution network and the subscriber growth there in that middle graph literally shows that the growth that we're getting month on month as the borders have opened up and the amount of investment we've made in social media, um, advertising, sponsorships, ambassadors that we're, we're bringing on board, the awareness of the Zolio product in the marketplace is extremely good. And that's obviously very much represented in the, in the growth in the, um, the website hits. So new value added services, Location Share Plus is a product that we just launched in May. Uh, we charge $7.95 in Australia for that service. And that allows customers to opt into that service as part of their subscription or on top of their subscription and allows them to set a preset um, interval from six minutes to four hours. So whenever the device is on, that can send to preset contacts within their, within their checking contacts. And basically a link gets delivered to the user and it shows them a map of current location and previous breadcrumbs. So it's quite a nice service. There's been a very good uptake since the launch of the product and all the feedback on that service has been exceptionally good. That also then provides other opportunities for us as we look at other value-added services and partnering opportunities specifically in the enterprise space where we can provide an, an API or an SDK for people to develop 
and utilize what, what we have in the Zolio to be able to provide some enhanced service and some partnering opportunities uh, there as well. So that's a, you know, it's a very exciting part as we grow further into the enterprise and government space. One important element here is what we call the network effect. So very similar to when WhatsApp launched many years ago, you know, someone sent you a message and said, can you download WhatsApp? Because that's how I want to keep in touch with you. We download WhatsApp. Similarly with the Zolio device, the Zolio registered user, the paying subscriber, can send a message to all of his contacts or selected contacts in order to download the Zolio app. Anyone can download the Zolio app for free. That Zolio app then enables app-to-app -app messaging, sharing checking locations, and it really provides the ability for a very enhanced messaging service from one to many. And the community of those people is obviously what gives us that access to be able to market to all those other people or look at value-added services that may even be applicable within the, um, within the cellular user as opposed to the, the user that's using the, um, the satellite device. So, you know, in the end, we end up with a much bigger ecosystem of Zolio users across the world. Significant government opportunities within Australia, I uh, just touched on briefly. So, you know, there's a high level of interest for the Zolio product. Being an Australian designed and supported device in Australia obviously has a great appeal. Um, you know, there's no reliance on ground infrastructure. So the Iridium network is unique in the sense that all the satellites are in the sky. There's not a single gateway in Australia to land any of that traffic. So the benefit is whether it be, um, you know, bushfires or cyclones or flooding, Zolia will always work. And I think that's a major advantage for a lot of these types of applications. We've got several, several small trials underway at the moment. Um, and just, you know, I guess the feedback we're getting from those trials is, is exceptionally good. Some of these trials are limited due to COVID, but, you know, people are grasping the concept of how Zolia can be quite widely um, dispersed. And also it's quite attractive from a price point. So, if, you know, $345 or just over $300 excluding GST, that stacks up extremely well compared to, you know, buying a satellite phone or even looking at some of the, um, you know, two-way or HF radios that get used quite predominantly uh, within these markets. Just a quick snapshot there of the market size, you know, there are lots of loan workers or remote workers across various industries that present an extremely good opportunity for us. New market expansion. Uh, we are looking to expand into Europe at the moment, and there is a lot of, lot of um, operations underway to ensure that we can do that. New Zealand, we will do uh, this month in July. So that's another important market for us. Uh, UK and selected EU markets will be early in 22. Now, the way the business is structured, which I think is on the next slide. So we, we get to share in the profits from everything else that's done in the world. So even though we have territories that we look after, when we launch into these new markets, the way the joint venture structure has worked is there's, there's always benefits for us in every Zolio subscriber, even though we have our own territories that we, um, that we look after. This will just give you a quick snapshot of that. I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is obviously available um, on the ASX site or on the Beam website. But just as far as the way the model works, so the JV is a 50-50 JV. Um, Beam and Roadpost are master distributors for their respective territories. And that obviously then means we control the sales and marketing activities within those, within those territories. Retailer sells devices. Uh, the retailer makes a margin on the sale of that product. And the retailer um, basically you know, sends the customer home and then the customer activates that service. Through the Zolio portal, we take the customer's credit card and all of their contact information, emergency contacts, et cetera. From that point forward, Zolio Inc. then bills that customer. There's no longer a relationship uh, with the retailer. The operating profit from the subscriptions are shared between the parties. So Beam and Roadpost, we receive 70% of the operating profit from the subscribers within our own territory. So everything from within Australia, New Zealand, China, and Japan is obviously in Beam's territory. Within Roadpost territory is USA and Canada. As I mentioned, for the rest of the world, the profits of that obviously get shared under the JV structure. 
So there is a benefit for us in everything that we do in every market that we open up and the opportunities that uh, present itself both within each other's respective territories, but also in, um, in, in new markets that, um, you know, that we execute in. We very often get asked how many subscribers have you got? We don't disclose how many subscribers that we have. We're not disclosing the current recurring revenues that we have, mainly for confidentiality reasons, as well as competitive reasons. But we did present this uh, just back in May to give, really just, I guess, just a snapshot as to what could this possibly mean for Bean? So assuming that we had say 15,000 subscribers within the Bean territories, this would generate about one and a half to $1.8 million in operating profit a year for Bean. Total revenue from those, if you made a base assumption that it's $29 per subscriber, having everyone on the lowest plan, then you're looking at about $5.2 million of subscription revenues. This also includes any, obviously any upside from uh, any value-added services that we're bolting onto those. This literally just looks at the base level. Our current subscriber forecast looks like we would get to about 15,000 subscribers by the end of FY23. So as I mentioned, this is purely just looking at within Beam's territories, doesn't take into account um, everything else in the rest of the world. Obviously the, um, the profit margin increases exponentially as more subscribers are added due to the, the strong leverage that we get across obviously the product development and obviously the platform that's supporting all of these customers throughout the world. Beyond all the numbers, growth in total subscriber numbers for the Zolio joint venture is obviously very important to be. So a lot of focus has been put around Zolio on a global basis and looking at and identifying and executing on those opportunities. Uh, yeah, because it is a 50-50 joint venture, we, yeah, we can't lose sight of the fact that in the event of you know, a sale of the Zolio business, not that we have any plans to sell it, but yeah, we are building an asset within the Zolio brand and the joint venture, which isn't realized on the balance sheet today. So it is important to realize we continue to make these investments but you know, we are building a global brand and we're building a successful global brand and done a very good job of that, that you know, as time goes on and we start reporting the recurring revenues into the, into the, um, in, into the parent company, um, then obviously that will start to be realized. But until that time, there's still a, you know, a major investment being made that is, you know, will have much larger returns as Zolio continues to grow and expand and there's a valuation uh, put on that particular business. Beam and Ropost don't need to contribute additional capital to the JV for its current operations in Australia and North America. We obviously have the expansions into new markets that may require some more capital, um, but that would be purely for sales and marketing activities. And Beam is able to fund its share of the investment from, from its existing uh, resources on, on its balance sheet. Okay, how was that for time? Yeah, I think we're I think we're good, Mike. And um, we're a little over, but uh, I just have a couple of questions. Some that were emailed ahead of time. I, I might just tackle these first. Um, seasonality across the business. Um, is is it you know first half, second half, or um, you know very um focused around you know. European summer or Australian, New Zealand summer. Yeah. Like just give us a sense of that in terms of uh, you know, how sales generally track throughout the year. Yeah. I would say, you know, up, up until a few years ago, it was a it was a very lumpy business. The benefit what we see now is the recurring revenues that we're getting from the likes of the Iridium Go product, where you know Iridium continues to order, you know, about seven and a half thousand of those units a year. We've got the Zolio product that we're now obviously invoicing those back to Zolio Inc. And just the underlying business. I mean, you know, we've got a lot more spread of where the revenues are coming from across the world. Um, and, you know, the, the likes of the sat phone shop business that used to be a lot more seasonal, you know, people with the product range that's in there and people doing a lot more traveling, what we're finding is that's really starting to level out. And obviously, you know, down the track, once those recurring revenues um, start to be consolidated into the business as well. They're obviously happening every month. But at the moment, we've got a really, you know, quite a good balance that is not as seasonal um, as it used to be. 
Okay, and then we got a few from the audience, but you've tackled one already in terms of subscriber numbers. So we'll just skip that one. Um, I'm not sure if this was on the slide when you were talking about it, but GPs on the device and the monthly plans, did you disclose that or do you want to uh, go back to that slide? Yeah, we haven't disclosed that anywhere um, for obvious you know, commercially confidence reasons. Uh, we, we have previously said that the margin on the Zolio device specifically is very low margin because it's all about getting the subscription revenues. But the, you know, the rest of our legacy business, the Iridium Go OEM products is really, you know, typical sort of margins, which I think, you know, we disclose in our annual reports and average margins. Um, but, you know, the Zolio is all about getting the subscriptions. So it's the, you know, it's the printer and cartridge, cartridge model. And, you know, obviously you can tell from that example that, you know, the, the revenues, if you look at just that example of Beam on its own, if you take into account the global revenues of Zolio and where we head to, yeah, that's where the real game changer is. I mean, you know, we, we could end up in a position where we're, you know, Zolio is generating hundreds of millions of dollars of subscription revenues. Okay, and then a, another one is linked to the, I guess the updated Iridium uh, device that's going to be coming out. Uh, I think it's a 2022 one, but is that going to follow the same subscription model or will it still follow the kind of existing Iridium sales model? Uh, nothing has been disclosed on that as yet. Um, as I think I did briefly mention there, we are looking at how some of these value-added services can be adopted to use on the, on the new Certus products that we develop but exactly what that looks like and how that's structured, we haven't disclosed. But it, it obviously makes very good sense. Okay. Okay, if we don't have any further one, that's all the ones that are emailed in ahead of time. If we don't have any further questions from the audience, I know we are gone slightly uh, over time. Okay, Michael, I, I, I know it's late in the evening, your side there uh, in the Windy City. So I think we, we leave it there. Thank you very much for... Um, dialing in at the very end of your day there in Chicago and we will uh, yeah watch out for the uh, the next quarterly update um, due I'm guessing towards the end of this month sometime correct thank you thank you very much everybody thanks Michael thanks everyone have a good rest of your Thursday <laughs>